Uh, my name is Natasha Milic Freiling, and I am professor of uh, computer science at University of Nottingham. I'm a chair in data science. I left Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Research, where I worked for 17 years here in the United Kingdom. Um, before joining Microsoft, um, I was studying uh, mathematics at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and then after that worked as a professor and uh, chair of the Department of Computer Science and Mathematics. I did join um, a startup company from Carnegie Mellon in 1990s. This was my first sort of uh, um, closer encounter with computer science and uh, the way things are done, both from the research and the uh, um, business point of view. So um, after five years, um, um, we were acquired by a corporation in Japan, Just System Corporation. Actually, it was after three years, and I continued to work to more as a director of research there. So, sort of, I experienced um, work in academia, and then startup, and then corporation like Microsoft, and now I'm back in academia. I am uh, finding it fantastically exciting um, because in academia now I have also option to combine um, teaching as well as impact through startups uh, in, and uh, collaboration with businesses. So, both of them are really um, my passion. Uh, for the 17 years in Microsoft Research, I led a team called Integrated Systems. We, on purpose, um, picked the name that is sort of um, ambiguous and enabled us to do a variety of things. Instead of sitting in one particular discipline like information retrieval or machine learning or human computer interaction, we looked at the end to end systems. We would start with the problem and then think what would be the architecture required to do this? What are the algorithms that are required? What should be the user experience? So it has been an extremely um, rich uh, research area. Almost anything that we have touched, primarily uh, from information management point of view and communication. I still remember in 1990s um, we started looking at new information retrieval systems, um, from going from Boolean systems when people will create and and all queries, very long ones, and um, search um, uh, mostly structured databases. We started looking at large corpora where the um, queries would be in natural language and the whole document would be evaluated and instead of having yes or no, it's relevant or not, you get a score. So that was quite interesting because then we started looking at the uh, notion of relevance. So that was the beginning, but then when I got, um, joined Microsoft, then I was looking not only at information retrieval models, for example, but what would it mean for information worker to engage, not only with search, but also extraction, authoring, uh, sharing information online. Then it becomes a much richer space for investigation. Uh, privacy in computing came very naturally from uh, information management because we have observed essentially um, transformation from uh, um, information retrieval in sort of library system where you have a single database and you search of something, suddenly going onto the web and web being such a complex infrastructure requires also very complex sustainability models and um, very quickly it became interesting from the business point of view because we have seen what are the business models that sustain the internet. And um, in that story we could also look what it means for individual. And unfortunately we have uncovered that individuals have been completely disempowered by not being given information about what's happening with the complex systems. It is always a very fine balance that um, a designer or technology needs to strike. It needs to provide uh, technology that's usable by people in everyday life, yet it needs to inform enough so that people can make intelligent decisions. When I'm driving a car, I don't really need to know how the car engine works, but I'm giving a steering and I give brakes, I give the lights, and I know how to use it. And from that perspective, it's completely transparent. What is the value exchange? If I'm given a browser and I'm not being told that when I'm browsing online, there is a tracking uh, behind the scene and exchange of my data, doesn't let me make an informed decision. It is hard for uh, everyday um, um, practices and individuals who do not uh, have education in computer science to un uncover what's going on behind the scene because their only communication with the system is through the user interface. And user interface is pretty much pretty, and uh, they have the buttons that are easy to click, and they're basically happy that they can use it. But they're not being told what the traffic is behind. Of course, they don't need to know everything that's happening behind. It's very complex. But we need to provide enough information for people to know uh, how much exposure there is. 
So I think education is absolutely critical as a first step, becoming aware um, what is going on. And then articulating preferences. There need to be some sort of engagement between individuals, the technology providers and the businesses, some sort of dialogue. Unfortunately, there is no dialogue at the moment from the consumer side. Technology has entered our lives so quickly. Um, it came at a speed that nobody expected. So my generation, I myself finished a whole PhD in mathematics using pencil and paper. I was writing my thesis on a Mac machine, primarily using it as a, as a typewriter. And that, was the end, uh, that was how technology entered my life. And my children are born in it. But what's lacking, none of, none of them actually is educated about um, tracking of cookies in, in, in schools. Um, they are giving advice. So definitely information still get, has to get into um, normal education curriculum. I'm really happy now to see that education is starting to pick up on uh, skill sets um, related to uh, programming because I expect in 10, 15 years from now when people um, use computing technologies, they will, be, they will want to become more inventive. They, they're already playing with the uh, various devices and customizing them. And I expect that computing will become like another alphabet. It will be something that they will be proficient in and without even knowing that it is hard. I mean, for most people now, it's hard. But we, we learn how our alphabet very early age and, and it becomes natural. As, as many of the visionaries in computing have already pointed out, we are just at the beginning. Just at the beginning, the computing technology is starting to enter in places where we, we did not expect, in our washing machine and the fridge, but also in our you know, uh, pacemakers, and, and soon they will be enhancing our capabilities. From the memory point of view, we are also seeing uh, fantastic applications in situations where we need to uh, replace, uh, have artificial limbs. Um, soon we will be doing, um, in medicine, curing um, and people with uh, guarded, uh, or guided um, capsules and so on. So we can't even imagine where this is going to go. The question is about understanding and if there is an intervention that's required, it has to be done by a human. Is it, is it the case that we will want to know if you have an enhancement of our you know, capacity, how to tune it instead, uh, instead of waiting for somebody else to tune it or become hooked in some um, centralized machine? So yes, there is sort of a scary bit of it, I, but I'm very optimistic that, that the future will be so exciting. I'm expecting that in 20, 30 years, my kids will be flying to the moon. And in that hostile environment, it will be computing that will help them. Because that's exactly where we don't have experience, we humans don't have. And we don't even have a sensory capacity, perhaps, to deal with the environments like those. That's where the computing can help. Yeah, I think the mobile, mobile technologies have truly revolutionized the way we do things. It is really hard to imagine uh, doing things the way we do it nowadays, which means the planning doesn't have to be much longer. You can think, do things um, more on an ad hoc basis if you need to. Uh, I have observed, especially with the younger generation, I have four children, I have two boys and two girls, and uh, I can see how they use mobile phones to coordinate their social life, extremely rich social life. Um, how things change quickly. At, at one moment they're going to the cinema, next moment they're meeting in a park, and it doesn't matter how many, often it's 10 people, and they can coordinate it within a split of a second. So it is really fantastic to see what it enabled enable them. From my perspective, it's also a safety thing. I know that I can always reach them. So in that respect, mobile has truly changed our, our everyday practices. Um, I have been involved in um, one project that uh, it's very dear to my heart and it has to do with mobility and it's mobility of blind people in cities. Um, as part of the Guide Dogs project, Guide Dogs is a charity in London uh, who partnered with the um, technology providers like Microsoft uh, to create technology that will be useful, useful to blind people as they're navigating the, the streets of London. And uh, you can imagine streets of London are a hostile, hostile place. It's for somebody who can't see. So um, um, guide dogs normally um, trains individuals to use dogs and cane, and uh, they have their own, um, the mobility instructors are um, expert in uh, skilling people um, to deal with such environments and experiences. Uh, with Microsoft technologies, we, we wanted to deliver what we call real-time information about the surrounding. 
and uh, doing it in 3D sound, uh, the sort of sound that is directional. So um, the instructions are always given from um, the direction where the place is, and most importantly, it's not blocking the ears. It is uh, going through the um, uh, headphones that are bone conducting. Um, we have deployed this with a number of individuals. First of all, we designed them with the uh, um, help of people with visual impairment. So all the way along through this design process, it was uh, really a, a high degree of empathy for the user experience and also designing for individuals who have a sort of a condition in a, a high level, high degree of uh, visual impairment, but also realizing that technology is applicable much more broadly. Almost, you know, with my glasses already, I, I, I feel that I can't do many things unless I have them around. So it, it, for all of us, at some point in our lives, we will experience that we are not completely self-sufficient anymore and that technology can help. The question only is, when we are designing this sort of technology, is it something that becomes our permanent solution to the problem or is it something that is a transitional phase? In this case, it is supposed to be an aid that would be helping and introducing new practices. But there are other scenarios where technology are just transitioning us from one habit to another um, and try to fit in our everyday life. 